Hey there, and welcome to Google's Innovation for the Nation 2013. I'm Christopher Dorabek, the anchor and managing editor of GovLoop's Dorabek Insider. It's an online program and blog that focuses on six words, helping government do its job better. And thank you for joining us for the Innovation of the Nation Virtual Summit, where we're also focusing on helping you do your job better. And we're doing that by uh, introducing you to the government transformers, the people who are out there doing it, making the innovation happen. And in this session, we're going to talk about the future of technology in the government. It is less of a debate today about cloud or no cloud, but the real question today is how you best use the cloud and how you integrate multiple clouds. And we're going to do that. We're going to talk uh, about that with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I got all the words out right. Uh, they were one of the early organizations to move to the cloud. We're going to find out how they did that, why they did that, and how, they're, how it's changed how they're doing business. Um, during our presentation and throughout the day, if you have questions, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we, you can submit your questions here in the Virtual Conference Center, or you can tweet us. Use our hashtag, you know how hashtags work, uh, hashtag IFTN2013, uh, Innovation of the Nation 2013. It's nice and easy, IFTN2013. Or you can tweet me directly, at Cdorabek. We will answer as many questions as we can. And uh, by the way, after we finish up here, there will be an opportunity to chat with our speakers. We'll tell you more about that later on. Earlier, we talked a little bit about the framework that we're living in today, that just this disruptive world and that the, the impact it's having on government. Uh, ahead, we're going to talk about mobile and security. No issues there, right? And we're also going to talk about needles and haystacks. We're, we're going to talk about uh, speeding access to that mission-critical knowledge, which we all know we have, but sometimes it's hard to hard to find and get access to, so we'll talk about that later on. And of course, if you miss any of these discussions, they are all going to be made available online, on demand, if you will, on the uh, Google Federal uh, YouTube page, and we'll also send you a link uh, after, if you registered, you'll get a link and you'll be able to find them all. But let's talk to some of the folks who are out there and doing this. Uh, one of them is Daniel McRae. He is director of NOAA's Service Delivery Division, and also joining me is Mike Bradshaw. He is director of Google Federal. Mike, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks, Chris. And it's good seeing you online. Um, Dan, thanks again for joining us today. We appreciate it. Uh, first question for you. Why did NOAA decide to go to cloud computing in the first place? Um, well, Mike, uh, several years ago, um, NOAA found itself in the position with uh, 19 distinct separate email systems. And um, you know, in, in retrospect, any uh, many decisions could look like the right decision, but uh, at that time it was pretty obvious that there was a need for an enterprise-wide integrated email system, and email is one of those things that uh, are fairly easy to do uh, in the cloud. It's been out there for a long time from the consumer side, and um, from it, it was a fairly easy decision for NOAA to do that. So. Um, about uh, two years ago, December 2011, is when the migration was complete and NOAA moved uh, 25,000 users into the Google Apps for Government environment um, using email initially. And then we also began to discover that uh, there, the other applications that were available uh, that permitted collaboration um, began to garner a lot of interest uh, amongst the NOAA users themselves, and it's kind of taken off from there. That sounds great. Um, what advice would you give to agencies who are considering a similar move to cloud computing? Well, um, I mean, the, the advice I'd give really isn't any different than what agencies should be doing, whether they're going to build their own or, or move into the cloud, and that is make sure you've got a really good handle on what the functional requirements are. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a number of mandates out, the cloud first federal mandate. Um, that doesn't mean take everything to the cloud without doing your homework first. So you need to have a good understanding of your functional requirements, uh, what your architecture is, and will the cloud services be able to integrate with your architecture. Um, you need to have a good understanding of um, how it's going to uh, integrate with your security model. And um, you also need to know uh, what 
contract or acquisition strategy you're going to take uh, in order to make this happen, um, which uh, Umesh, the previous speaker, alluded to in terms of how the government's going to uh, need to sort of take an, a different approach to acquiring these services. Um, the number one thing I would say is make sure you've got good governance in place, policies and procedures for how you think you want to use these cloud services before you go out and try uh, to buy them. Mike, can I just butt in and ask, is it a different skill set than you have had? Have you had to tweak your skill sets in order to, to manage this effectively? Um, so that's a good question, uh, Chris. The, the skill sets are morphing, I think, across the federal government. When you look at what's necessary to manage uh, or, or even, in some sense, uh, broker cloud services within a federal organization, as opposed to the skill sets are, uh, that are required um, to manage the infrastructure itself. And so uh, you, you need people that have good project and program management skills, that have an understanding of um, different approaches to acquisition, um, being able to really drill down and distill the functional requirements into something meaningful that, could, that can then be translated into a uh, a solicitation package that you're going to put out for for comp uh, competition. So yes, the skill sets are are different and they uh, they are evolving. Yeah, and Dan, following up on that one as well, um, how has the acceptance been of the new technology? I think sometimes change management can be some of the most difficult part of moving to the cloud. Um, so that that's an excellent point. I mean, you know, everyone has their personal preferences. Uh, or they get used to working within a, 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 a specific environment. And um, when you look at software as a service in particular, where you're going to be putting something in front of an end user, managing expectations is key. And uh, Noah, during the email migration, spent a great amount of time in making sure that um, there was a good communication strategy developed, uh, that we involved um, the end user community early on in, in helping to get an understanding of what was going to be necessary um, and then making sure they had training resources available as well. So managing expectations and developing a good communications plan is critical as you start moving away from stuff you own to um, stuff that you're going to acquire from, uh, uh, from a different source. Yeah, it's a great point. I think you guys really led the way as far as showing best practices for that migration. And you certainly had an interesting group of people there, the scientists. I mean, NOAA is a, is a somewhat different community of government employees, uh, very interesting ones. Um, it's also a highly mobile workplace. So what are you doing to address the needs of the mobile employee at NOAA? At NOAA? Uh, so it is a highly mobile work uh, workplace. Um, you know, we've got employees in every weather forecast office in every state uh, uh, throughout the United States, and um, we've got folks that are doing research on uh, glaciers. We have folks on the ground that are doing, um, you know, damage assessments after severe weather. We've got them on NOAA ships, uh, um, uh, you know, taking measurements. So they're, they are literally all over the place, and um, uh, we want to be able that they can use a variety of platforms to do the job, and whether that's a notebook computer, a Chromebook, a thick client, or some other smartphone type of, uh, of device, um, we want to make sure that they have the tools necessary. So uh, we, in addition to, to what you would think is traditional email, services acquired through uh, the Google Apps. Um, we also have the, um, the Drive and the productivity applications that are part of that. And so with those services being in the cloud, it's very easy for folks to um, collaborate um, independent of their geographical location and, and really time um, because all of those services are uh, not tied to a specific physical place. Um, so for the folks that are spread across, uh, you know, multiple states or, or areas, um, they have uh, the ability to collaborate in real time. Um, 
I personally encountered a, uh, an opportunity to put this to the test. I'm on a, uh, an assignment uh, to the department and um, it involves probably a dozen folks from different bureaus, uh, Census, NOAA, NIST, and, and some of the other bureaus as well. And we all came together in a very uh, short time frame uh, to work on this project. And um, what we were able to do was use the Google Apps ecosystem to rapidly set up a site, uh, a Google site, literally within hours of us getting notification about this project. Um, and many of my colleagues from the other bureaus have not, uh, are not in this environment. Um, so with very little training, we were able to set up this site, show them how to, you know, essentially navigate, um, and we now have a document repository, we've got a shared calendar, we have lists, we've got real-time collaboration on documents and reports that we were producing, um, and I myself took a Chromebook and nothing else with me and have been living down in, uh, in office space in the department for the last three, uh, three weeks and have been able to, to basically take care of everything I needed to with that Chromebook, which the lesson that I take away from that is it opens up lots of opportunities for NOAA going forward to think about um, how we want to address things like telework, uh, a highly mobile workforce, and a virtual desktop infrastructure, for example. That takes on a completely different dynamic and characteristic um, given the experience that I'm, I'm living in right now. But Dan, Mike asked about uh, uh, how you're dealing with change management and being able to have, being able to do exactly what you're talking about. That has to help a lot in terms of employees going, hey, this isn't such a bad thing. Um, right. So the idea is, I think, that, um, you know, again, employees tend to have a, a preference and uh, for what they use. So the focus is make sure you're meeting the mission re mission requirements, um, exposing them in a very you know non-threatening way uh, about the the uh, capabilities that are out there. And what we've seen is a lot of sort of grassroots enthusiasm about the services and the capabilities that are built in uh, to the Google Apps ecosystem. Uh, to include sites. Um, once we activated sites, uh, there was a, a, a big rush for folks to begin um, putting those uh, or making use of, of those services. Uh, so I think, you know, employees have a really, really good ideas about how to get their job done. And you want to make sure you're listening to, to that, the, to those good ideas. And then going out and acquiring the services that will enable them to get their jobs done in the most effective way. And by effective, I mean mission alignment, um, reduced risk footprint, and good uh, taxpayer ROI. If you can do those things, um, I think you've got, a, uh, you've got a recipe for success there. You know, Dan, um, you know, going back to your Chromebook discussion here, uh, you and I talked about that before, and you said this is actually sort of a special assignment that you have here to see if you can completely live in this environment, uh, try out the browser-only, um, you know, environment. Uh, again, I think it's another place where NOAA is leading the way. Is there any other, uh, any other detail you can give us about that or any place, uh, tell us where you'd like to take this going forward, or, and what do you think you're going to find uh, as a result of this assignment? Um, well, sort of as a follow-on to this assignment, um, what I would like to do is uh, take a look at, um, you know, figuring out is there a, a subset of the workforce in NOAA that can live essentially um, within that environment and only that environment and not need access to a thick client with locally installed applications, for example. And um, if there is uh, a, a large enough uh, population within NOAA that can simply exist in that environment, that opens up all sorts of opportunities for us. Um, the need for a traditional VDI really goes away at that point. Because if you look at the three big buckets of virtualization, the user state, um, 
the application and then the server virtualization pieces, you've effectively virtualized the user state if they can live with Chrome and the Google Apps. They have access to that anywhere from any device um, in a very, you know, in, in a secure manner. Um, which then it gives you the ability to sort of refocus the resources uh, rather than trying to do a BDI across the board and building out an infrastructure that may be required to support that. Uh, you can do it in a much more cost effective way if you know a large section of your uh, of your workforce can use the uh, Chromebook model uh, you free up resources to then build out sort of a best of class traditional VDI for that portion of the workforce that really needs access to maybe some specialized uh, applications or secure remote access to server-side applications within the NOAA infrastructure uh, so it, it, it's sort of a false uh, force multiplier from that effect um, because it, it, you know, as was pointed out in the previous session as well, budgets are not getting bigger and we have to get smarter about how we uh, prioritize the resources that we do have available. And so I, I look at that from a number of, um, a number of angles uh, and I think using, um, using the Chromebook example uh, is is a good opportunity for us there. That's Mike, great. I just want to butt in because we had a, a great question from Twitter, and, and Dan, I know this isn't your expertise, but uh, uh, at Book Hut was saying, um, you of course, mapping a lot of mapping goes into atmospheric research, and there must be tools and apps that you can use to actually help you do that job better. Uh, sure, Chris. I mean, you know, NOAA produces lots of data, and pretty much all the data that NOAA produces is geospatially referenced in some way, whether it's a, you know, a sea surface temperature in the Atlantic or, or data informing a weather forecast. Um, so the, the Google Maps engine uh, is in use in NOAA. Um, I, it, it is not in my, uh, my portfolio specifically, uh, but I think there's lots of opportunity there um, to begin to develop uh, applications that um, ride on uh, those those different platforms and for example um, getting uh, storm damage assessment teams on the ground with a smartphone in their hand running that type of app that's updating a database uh, on the back end uh, or you know, folks taking um, surveys of fish populations in the field. Uh, those are all functions that are being performed now. And I think um, with the, the the different platforms that are out there, the the Maps Engine and the Apps Engine specifically, we've got a great opportunity here um, to evolve those processes. I think, you know, personally, this is an exciting time to be at NOAA because I think we're just on the cusp of moving away from the traditional software as a service tradition you know the the email and the office productivity apps and really moving into some of these other areas which are uh, very exciting yeah and Dan that was the point I was going to make about NOAA again uh, email in the cloud you know more utilitarian it seems like right now NOAA is on the leading edge of looking at some of these different technologies such as geospatial technologies and it you know, leading the way there as well. And it's very exciting to watch you guys. Um, any other transformation uh, projects you have going? Uh, sounded like a lot already. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if they're uh, transformative as much as, um, you know, just trying to do the right things. I think uh, we have a mobile device management um, platform that we have as software as a service. And, what that's going to do, I think, is position us uh, very well for looking at a, a, a bring your own device or, you know, I'm, I'm inclined to say use any device uh, very shortly here. Uh, we have it in a, uh, in, a, in a testing mode right now. Um, that particular platform, uh, again, because we acquired it as a software as a service, very easy to deploy, set up, establish. And um, I'm excited about what that holds as the future, uh, for the future. Our entire tier one service desk 
uh, for our corporate services um, was acquired as software as a service as well. Um, and I, you know, I think we're going to continue to evolve that. Um, and then again, just looking at different applications and services that uh, will help us better serve the, uh, the, the no workforce and the public at large, um, again, I think we're just, we're just on the cusp of it. Um, and so this is an exciting time to be in NOAA. It, it, I mean, does it just blow anybody else away that we're talking about bring your own device and a government frame? I mean, if you had asked me this three years ago, I would have put a lot of money down that this wouldn't even be on the table for government. <laughs> and yet uh, people are seriously looking at it. Well, I, I think you have to, Chris. Um, you know, it's going to come down to the business case, right? And that, that goes back to what are the mission requirements? What do the security requirements dictate? Um, and and does it, is, it, is it cost effective? Uh, you know, if you if you find yourself with a with a with a, with a set of highly specialized requirements to meet your mission needs, that probably shouldn't go in the cloud, right? I mean, so you 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 really have to look at what the business case is. But I think you know you can't you have to do the business case. You can't ignore it. Um, and whether it comes down to uh, you know, making it more beneficial for the end user because they have a device now that they're used to um, using on a daily basis, whether that frees up other resources to invest in um, other services within the organization, uh, or whether it's just a, a way to, um, you know, position your organization as a good place to work because you have those types of programs, uh, you, have, you have to look at all of those options. Um, and you're right. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, there was lots of resistance, and I think that uh, uh, you know, resistance is futile uh, at this point. You at least got you got to do the business case on these things. Let me ask a question from Alan Marcus, who uh, uh, used our online platform to send us a question. And he says, "How do you deal with sensitive data? That that I mean, email is such a pro, it's the way we do business now. And how sure. do you deal with that sensitive stuff?" So. Just because you put it in the cloud doesn't mean you get to forget about it, right? So there's there's still the due diligence aspect, and the organization is responsible for that. Uh, so when you're looking at software as a service or other cloud services that uh, you want to acquire, uh, you need to make sure it fits within your security requirements. Uh, and so for NOAA, we have to you know comply with the FISMA requirements and the NIST regulations and Department of Homeland Security requirements. Uh, and you have to make sure that your service provider um, can uh, adhere to those requirements. Uh, the, the, the FedRAMP initiative uh, is, is an effort for the government at the federal level to help define what some of those should look like, but still each organization is going to have its own requirements. And the other thing I would mention is, you know, as organizations begin to adopt these services, um, and they might want system integrators in the mix there to help facilitate, uh, you know, moving into those services. You have to make sure that those system integrators, as well, if they're providing some process or procedure or infrastructure, are also signing up to your uh, security requirements and and can meet those uh, can meet those needs of the organization. Mike, is the security issue, how much is that, as you're out talking to folks, is that still the driving factor here? Is that the first thing people ask you about? Uh, Chris, I think it's actually evolved a lot. It was originally the only question they asked us about up front. Uh, I think a lot of people understood cloud computing, but security was the biggest question we got. Then people began to realize that probably security in the cloud was better for them than what they had in an on-premise solution just because of the number of people who could focus on the security um, aspect. Um, we're seeing it pop up again every once in a while, um, but uh, it certainly is not the center of attention that it was, let's say, three or four years ago when cloud computing came on. As Dan said, you determine what you should be putting in the cloud, what data should go in there, and, and you know, make those decisions. You always have to think about it. Uh, Dan, oh, we only have a couple minutes left, but talk about how you measure return on investment in, in all, everything that you've done, which is, sounds like so much. What do you do in your free time? But how do you measure, measure return on investment in all this? Um, 
so there's a couple ways you can do that, Chris. I mean, again, I I have a tendency to to focus, or maybe some people would say fixate on the uh, the functional requirements and, and the business case, right? And so some some of these decisions will be very obvious uh, from a pure cost basis. Um, NOAA, uh, I'm not going to go into specific figures, but you can probably surmise that moving from 19 independent, uh, discreetly managed email systems into a single email platform uh, probably saved us for some money in the long run. Um, and so you can look at it from a, tr a traditional sort of cost-benefit analysis as well. Um, before you go out and buy these things, you should really be benchmarking what your cost of operations are so that you can, uh, 12 months, 24 months into it, look and see what the returns are. Um, you know, nothing, there's nothing out there that says once you make the decision, you can't make another decision after that if it looks like it was the wrong one to do. Uh, so you you got to keep a keep an eye on your traditional sort of cost model. Um, another way you can measure it is if you have people right now that are involved in managing your infrastructure that you own. Um, my to-do list is much longer than the resources I have available to me to get those things accomplished. So there's an opportunity cost in there as well. So if I can move services into the cloud that will then free up those resources to focus on more mission um, mission aligned activities I recoup that opportunity cost um, so that's another way to look at sort of the the, the return on investment um, holistically above and beyond what your uh, uh, you know typical cost model would be um, along that lines however I would say that you know one of the challenges is that um, you do have to be careful about the, the personnel aspect and, and moving stuff into the cloud. Many of the cost savings are strictly based on uh, what you're going to recoup based on um, you know, the, the, the personnel or the positions you'll be able to, to, to give up or, or give back. And I think before you do that, you need to see if, if, is there an opportunity cost associated with that and can you refocus those folks to do um, more mission to line activities within the organization. Uh, we only have three minutes left, and and Mike, I, I want to ask both of you the same question. But as you mentioned, that, that things have evolved over time. We're talking the cloud discussion is much different today than it was even a year ago. What folks who are tuned in and and are thinking about this and they're going hearing what Noah's doing and saying, hey, I, I'd like to be there. What should they be thinking about? Where should their mindset be? Mike so first, and then I'll me, go to Mike first. I, I think we have to step way, way back and look at, are we applying some security standards to technology that's available now? Are we applying older technology stand, uh, security standards to them, realistically? Um, we have great technology that's evolving very quickly. It's evolving so that it can deal with threats coming at companies from around the world. There's a lot of great cost-saving benefits to them. and as a federal government, you know, can we step back and maybe be a little bit more uh, or evolve a little bit more quickly as far as looking at that technology and how it can be used in the in the government to save a lot of money and to help get information out to um, customers? Dan, what do you tell your fellow agencies that are looking to step into the cloud? Um, well, there's there's probably a few points. Uh, you know, Mike certainly hit on, on uh, a couple of the major ones there. Uh, one I would say governance. Make sure you've got your, your, your policies and procedures well established. Going to the cloud can do lots of good things for a well-managed IT operation. Taking a poorly managed IT operation into the cloud is a recipe for disaster. Um, make sure you've got good architecture alignment. Uh, make sure you've got your security requirements uh, established uh, well in advance and that your partners know what those security requirements are early on in the process 
and awesome. make sure you got to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Okay. I told you we'd run out of time. Isn't it nice <laughs> when we do? Uh, I want to thank Google's Mike Bradshaw and Noah's Daniel Dan McRae. Uh, but nice job. A reminder that if uh, we didn't get to your question, well, you still have an opportunity. Uh, Mike and Dan are going to be uh, hanging out. Well, I keep using that, that term. They're, we're hanging out here. Uh, they're going to be, you can chat with them in our uh, virtual conference center. And uh, if there's something we didn't touch on, you can do that right now. Uh, so head over there next. And uh, this and all of our sessions will be available on demand on the Google Federal YouTube page. We'll, if you registered, you'll get the link. Uh, coming up, we're going to talk about needles and haystacks and uh, how you can speed access to that mission critical knowledge that's uh, ahead. We're also going to talk about working better together, collaboration. I know what a shock. We've heard a little bit about that already. But coming up next, we're going to talk about mobile and security. Uh, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mike. Great hanging out with you. We'll be back. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Mike. Take care. Bye-bye.